You're listening to Behind the Wheels with Doug Mason, Dave Walters, and Mike Yeagley. This is a show where we talk about heavy truck and medium-duty axolands. Doug, Dave, and Mike bring close to 100 years of experience and expertise in the transportation business. Join us once a month to learn new things about axolands. Sponsored by Alcoa Wheels, the global leader in aluminum wheel innovation. Welcome back to... TMC 2020, and we're here, uh, Mike Yeagley. And Doug Mason. And joining us is Grant DeGeorge. Grant, great to have you. Yeah, nice to be here, Mike. Thanks. <laughs> so Grant is the global uh, design manager for Alcoa Wheels. Mm -hmm. yeah, he's also uh, one of the main secretaries here working for the S2 tire and wheel yep. subgroup. Yep, happy to support the uh, tire and wheel group here. Oh, here great. At so one of the things that I wanted to talk a little bit about is, and I, I don't think a lot of people really understand how complex a wheel is. When, when a, wheel, I, a wheel's round, Mike. What's the big deal? <laughs> I know. My background was wiring. You know, I, I started out in CAE, and then I did wiring for about 14 years. And when I had this opportunity to come join the wheel group, I was talking to my manager, and I said, you know, I'm thinking about going into wheels. He goes, well... You know, that's not a problem. I, I said, well, I don't know anything about wheels. And he said, that doesn't matter. How, make it round. It'll be fine. And that is pretty much the standard answer I've gotten for years. And I think we've all heard that. Make the wheel round, and it's going to be fine. And wheels are far, far more complex. And I would argue that wheels are probably, I've worked with differentials, I've worked with other components in a vehicle. And I know pistons are very complex. And a lot of the same problems that pistons have, for example, back many years when I was doing CAE on pistons, the, the problems pistons had were very similar to the kinds of problems wheels have. You know, wheels are really surprisingly difficult to design. And I didn't understand that. I didn't expect it. So I wanted to bring Grant in to talk about that a little bit. Well, wait a minute. How, how long have you been uh, designing wheels, Grant? Been with Alcoa Wheels for almost 13 years now. So uh, I designed wheels for approximately 10 of those. Uh, well, you really still yeah, help design yeah, them now. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. okay. The, the first 10, yeah. yeah. Grant was the one who came through with the breakthrough early on in his career on designing the seven-spoke wheel. That was a very, very complex... Oh, you might want to explain more what a seven-spoke wheel means. People are going to think that's just a simple seven-spoke. Well, Grant, you want to talk about yeah. that? Well, like you said, Mike, uh, usually our wheels are round and our hand holes are round, but... Uh, the seven-spoke wheel was a, a special wheel we wanted to design for one of our OEMs, uh, and they had some very aggressive styling in that wheel. Um, typically, in the truck wheel industry, you, you know, styling stops you know, with not much flair. Um, but a lot of the truck customers want auto-style wheels, auto-style uh, handholds. Uh, so what we did was is we, we looked at a wheel and pushed the limits to our styling capabilities in the handhole with a seven-spoke wheel. Much like a, a trapezoid, it had a lot of deep bevels to the design. So very complex geometry in the handhold that we had to make sure uh, we kept the stresses in check. Something we haven't really done before, um, what we typically see with a, a round handhold. Right. So you're talking about stresses. You might want to explain a little bit to the crowd what we're talking about. Obviously, you went from a round handhold, you went to a, like a trapezoid. So what's the big deal? It just is a different window. Right. So... Uh, typically, when you're looking at an FEA uh, for a wheel, you're looking at max principal stresses, you're looking at min principal stresses, and how that operates within a round handhole is much different than what you would see in a stylized handhole. The location changes, the, uh, the stress amplitudes change, um, and it's really just really understanding how that wheel will perform in the field and on our tests you know, to make sure that it still is a good wheel. So we got to look at a lot of those things for those stresses in the handhole to make sure it works. One of the things that maybe our listeners can get their heads around is when you think of a round handhole wheel, every edge of that handhole has an equal radius to it. And when you have a straight line and then have a radius, you're really concentrating your stresses right in that radius. And so those radius, radii really sort of grab the stresses. And when you limit the number of radius, instead of having the whole thing just being one circle, you're concentrating the stresses in a trapezoid, you know, in those three locations. And you really have to be careful how you manage 
those three locations. I remember the kind of work went into that. And then you also have to work with the manufacturing capabilities. You know, you're having to take into account what manufacturing can do. I mean, the, if we could design anything, if we didn't have to worry about actually making this in the hundreds or thousands or millions of wheels at a time, it'd be a way easier. But the fact is, is that we have to be looking at this from a standpoint of, is this manufacturable? Yeah. That's where I started out my career, basically, was working in the facilities, uh, in the plants. We were making wheels, and I remember you know, engineers coming in and saying, hey, it worked on, the t uh, on our tube. We did the FEA. It's fine. How come this wheel isn't passing? You're doing something wrong in manufacturing. And uh, it's, it's never uh, as easy as it seems, regardless of what you're making, but obviously with a wheel and getting those radiuses, then again, that are no longer a consistent radius from a, a round handhole, now you're coming in, and if you have any type of a, a tooling chatter, or if you have uh, a chamfer that didn't get put in place right, that's uh, sharper than it's supposed to be, you've now concentrated those stresses even further. Mm -hmm. And I know that you have to take that into account, Grant, when you're doing the designing. Yeah, we definitely uh, we know our limits, and when we start getting close to those, we know we have to take manufacturing into account. And if it's something we can avoid, you know, that's, that's something we will. But uh, definitely with the seven spoke, we were we were pushing our limits, and uh, we were able to get a successful successful design onto that one. So when you're designing a wheel, just uh, let's pull back and look at this from a bigger picture and some of the things that make designing a wheel complex. Let's start w at the beginning. You know, you've got a load. You know, you, well, the, let's, st let's start with that, like you're saying, because I think you get a little perspective to people. We're talking about, like, if we look at a pass car light truck wheel, right, your, your wheel load rating may be what? 1,500, 2,000 pounds, yeah. something like that. Something so then like that's that. normal. That's a, you know, you're driving along in your light duty pickup truck or whatever it might be. And a wheel for that application, a stylized wheel, you might see weighs 30 pounds, 32 pounds. It's highly stylized, might be even more than that. I know I worked with some uh, OEMs and we made 40 pound wheels for them for uh, their larger pickup trucks. We are now making wheels that carry what load? 7,400 pounds. And how much do they weigh? 40 pounds. So 39, uh, actually. 39, yeah, 39. We, just, we, just, we, we just launched a third, all 39, 39 pound wheel, yes. So a 39 pound wheel that holds 7,400 pounds uh, is a significant engineering feat when you consider that a standard pass car light truck wheel can weigh up to 30 to 40 pounds, carrying not even a, a third of that weight. So now you add on to that, that load is coming to the wheel through the tire. And this kind of thing, uh, no two tire manufacturers are identical. They all have different strategies. Yeah, we've learned that the right. hard way. We've <laughs> learned that the hard way. So, so the tire manufacturers have different strategies, and then the tires have, you know, very different if you're going with, uh, you know, Michelin has many, many 275, 70, you know, all, mm -hmm. they, they have all these different... Uh, different applications. Different right? applications. Yep. Yeah. But th all those applications are going to be using our wheels. So how do you handle that, Grant? Yeah, so we got to make sure we take a look at the whole system. Um, as you say, like, I mean, it's the tire, it's the, uh, the mounting system, it's everything that goes into the, how the load is transferred into that wheel. Um, but yeah, you, you bring up a good point for us, no tire is the same. So we, we've done some testing. Uh, we know what may be the most severe application. Uh, so we, we incorporate that into our FEA uh, to make sure that we are designing the wheel that, that makes sure we can do, um, they can handle those highest loads. Another component to all of this, you know, so you, you've got this tire, the load coming through the tire into the wheel, and the tire is not a solid piece. It's, it's rubber, it's inflated, so the air pressure plays a, a role in all this. There's all these different things that are playing a role in getting the load from the road into the wheel, going through that tire. So that's, that's a whole complex calculus all by itself that if anybody really wanted to get into it, you could dedicate a lifetime just to understanding that. That's the first complexity to designing a wheel. The second major complexity to de designing a wheel is the fact that it's rotating. Mm -hmm. Grant, you want to talk about that a little bit? What does the rotation do to the stresses? Because the load is being transferred uh, through the tire into the wheel at, at different locations uh, throughout the rotation, uh, you've got to make sure you're taking into account, um, I guess, that full cycle as the stresses are being transferred. It's not just in one spot. And the load changes. So you got to make sure that uh, the wheel can handle um, that change in load as it's going through that, that rotation. For example, and this is where it's more similar than when I was talking earlier 
about a little bit of work I did on pistons, right? The pistons were going through the same problem. They were getting just, you know, millions of cycles of the stress. That, and then it would go through, through this. It wasn't like a tensile test machine. A tensile test machine for our listeners is when you take a bar of metal and you pull it apart and break it until it breaks. And then that's a very predictable failure. The bar will stretch and then it stretches elastically where it can go back to its original shape. And then it eventually starts stretching to the point where, like a spring, like we talked about mm -hmm. in our first episode, where the spring starts giving way and now it's it not yields, it yeah. yields. It's not gonna go it's not gonna go back to its original shape. Then it eventually will completely break if you continue to to pull it. So it goes through elastic, then yield, then ultimate and, and failure. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's a very predictable Failure. It's one cycle. It's, and it's all one cycle. One cycle, yep. But what this is, is this is something way more complicated. The best, uh, best way to describe, we're talking about like fatigue now and cycles is really what you're trying to get at. And, and you basically create damage in a wheel where there's a high load, a high stress area. And you can think about it as an old fashioned metal hanger. I don't know if any of you were, when you were kids, at least we used to do this, think you were tough, you'd take a hanger and you'd start bending it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and finally you'd break it. Well, you could have never just like pulled it apart and broke it, right? And you can't do that. Uh, but what happens is you start bending, you create a high stress at that bend point, you start causing deformation or damage to occur, I'll put it that way, and, and you bend it once, no big deal. You bend it back, no big deal. You bend it again, it's a little harder to bend, but you keep bending it and finally it breaks because you've created enough damage that it no longer can hold or sustain the load you're putting in. And that's really kind of what happens to a wheel, right, Grant? Well, if, that'd be great if it always happened in the same spot. Right, 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 <laughs> right yeah, that would be. <laughs> Fortunately, with a wheel, there's a lot of different areas we gotta we got to look at. Uh, with the rim, the handhole is basically any interrupted surface. you yeah. got to make sure we, we apply that hangered me methodology to each of those spots. So um, it, it is very difficult to understand each of those areas' limits um, as it goes through that, that cyclic load yeah. uh, with the tire involved. Now, typically, we use something called the RR Moore test to try to predict if you have a piece of metal, and we, let's take 6061 aluminum. You take 6061, you machine it to a very precise geometry, and then you put it into an RR Moore machine, uh, uh, RR Moore test, which is basically just a cyclic, you know, cyclic, yeah. cyclic fatigue testing. And let's say you do 10 of them. Well, you do, you do them at different stress levels, right? I mean, you're starting to get into the discussion of what we call a, a fatigue curve or an SN curve. How many cycles does it take at a certain load for it to fail? You can go into you know, many textbooks uh, and you look at material properties. You were talking about basically yield strength, ultimate strength, you know, elongation. All of those play a part in what your actual fatigue strength or fatigue life is going to be. And so we would take a, a material, like you said, that bar, we would pick different stress levels, and with that we would then run fatigue on it, uh, rotating beam fatigue, fully reversed loading, and then that would allow us to say at this stress level I get this many cycles, this stress level I get so many more cycles, this stress level I get so many more cycles, and you can almost get to a point, especially in steel, not so much in aluminum, where you, can, you can't fail it anymore. You could run infinite cycles and it wouldn't fail, but that's such a low stress level. And so we have to predict what the life of the wheel we want to be and balance that with the weight of the wheel and the stress that has to be in place. Right, Grant? Right, absolutely. And Grant, I've seen the test data multiple times, these RR more samples. What Doug was talking about was getting it at different stress levels. But if you do multiple ones at the same stress level, you'll oh, get... A lot of scatter. There's a yeah. lot of scatter. Yeah. And this is sort of what I was getting at is like things come into play. You know, and it gets very, very difficult making you know, Grant's job that much more <laughs> yeah. difficult because that, that fatigue is going to cause, uh, there's going to be failures. You know, sometimes they're going to come in short, sometimes they're going to go long. You don't know, and things like heat treat, grain structure, there's all sorts of stuff that comes into play th that influences when you're talking about a fatigue failure rather than yeah, a I'll, tensile yeah, failure. Right. Way, way before we get to the design. Right. Yeah, exactly. To understand that deep understanding of the material you're working with 
is another component to the complexity of designing a wheel. Now that goes, that complexity goes into any item that is subjected to fatigue. Correct. The, the fatigue issue is, is notoriously difficult to predict. Now we do a pretty good job. Grant, Grant and his team do a, yep. a pretty good job at that. But and, it's, and we it's design tricky. with safety factors in mind as well. Exactly, yeah. And so that's, I think that's another part of it too, is you use statistical theory really based on what we've done to allow us to design uh, to a statistically safe level of stress, right? And then, then we have our own fatigue testing that we do right. uh, that will replicate what's going on in the field as best as possible. Well, you bring up one last point that I wanted to talk about is the field. Mm -hmm. You know, who, who knows what happens out in the field apart from Dave Walters? There's a very, very small population of people who truly understand what's happening out in the field. Anything can happen out there. And, and unfortunately, too many engineers aren't aware of what's happening in the field. No, and that's one thing that we do as well. I think, Grant, you know, you take a look at what our warranty is when you design a wheel. We take a look at... Now, how do you do that? How do you? Yeah, I mean that's the that's the best place to look is how actually people are using our wheels, um, basically because the damage we're putting on a wheel in the field may not be the damage we're considering or testing for um, initially. So when you get that feedback, that just gives you the uh, uh, the idea of, of of what targets you need to to, to design for. So there's different damage cycles, you know, maybe in more lateral loads, maybe more cornering loads, where it's positioned on the vehicle. You know, if you're getting to vocational applications where they're, you know, really, really going to the extremes for that wheel, you got to make sure that you're designing uh, for those for those specific mm -hmm. applications. So I think that gives our listeners a little bit of an understanding, uh, just a thumbnail sketch. Well, of just maybe just one more topic okay. while we got Grant here, because I know you have some constraints when you design a wheel. You can't just go design a wheel any way you want, right? That's what, true. What are, what are some of those constraints, just uh, so maybe people will understand some of the specs, maybe some of the things that out there that, that limit what you can do? Right. It's not, it's not a cookie-cutter design. Uh, you know, when somebody wants a 22 and a half, eight and a quarter wheel, um, we just don't, you know, pull a design from, uh, from our back pocket and, and run it through, run it through test. Um, you know, there's a lot of things we gotta, we got to get from the customer, whether it be the mounting system, uh, the offset, uh, whether it be the whether it's going to be used in the steer position, we got to you know sometimes some customers are more sensitive to the inset. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's used in the dual application, obviously the the half dual space and the offset is more important. Uh, but between that, the load rating, the pressure ratings, uh, what application they're using it in, whether they're using disc brakes, whether they're using drum brakes, right, you know right. what you know, it's the whole system solution that we need to think about uh, when we're designing a wheel. We've brought up tires before. It's very important to cross-reference the wheel you're designing for with the tires that are available in the market. Michelin, Goodyear, all the uh, all the big players in the in the market, they're always coming out with new tires, new load ratings, new applications. So we want to make sure we have a wheel uh, that matches those applications. So those things are we all look into every time we're designing a wheel. Yeah, very good. And then there's also like a SAE, not SAE, but Tire and Rim Association. Uh, there's some standardization that's out there that limits us in certain areas of the wheel as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah, well, there's there's standardized mounting systems uh, developed by SAE, so we make sure we follow those. Uh, there's international standards that we also have to be uh, aware of if we're not just selling the wheel in North America. When you mentioned tire and rim, they do a great job in, in telling us how to design the rim to make sure it fits the, uh, the tires that are available in the market. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing we want to do is design a wheel that, you know, the moment you try to put a tire on it, it doesn't work, or you, you, <laughs> you mess up the tire. So, yes, the tire and rim gives us those those min max dimensions on the tire side that that helps us design a rim to make sure it's all compatible. Um, so that's other things we got to yeah, take account. Yeah, very good. All right. Okay. Well, I think that does it. Grant, hey, thank oh, you for stopping it, by. I really yep. loved having yep. you. Thanks, Doug. And thank you for joining us on Behind the Wheels. See you next time. Sponsored by Alcoa Wheels, the global leader in aluminum wheel innovation, manufacturing, and technology. Inventing the first forged aluminum wheel in 1948, its team of experts continue to develop the most lightweight, efficient, and high-performing commercial vehicle aluminum wheel products. Bringing you revolutionary innovations like Alcoa Durabrite wheels, Alcoa Durablack wheels, the new Alcoa Wheels hubboard technology, and the lightest truck wheel on the market, Alcoa Ultra One 22 and a half by eight and a quarter wheel. Alcoa Wheels, the global leader in aluminum wheel innovation.